Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. My name is Jeff. And my name is Nathan, also known as the Seawood Scribe. There you go. So yeah, thank you very much for uh, for joining us, Nathan. I know that uh, our listeners probably remember you from uh, you've you've submitted various things to the podcast, of course. Yes. But um, in October of last year, we had a giveaway of Strahd's Manual of Shadow. That's right. And that was yours. That that was something you made. Yep. Oh right. Yeah. yeah thank yeah, you yeah. for having me. Since I started listening to this podcast, I've wanted to find some way to like guest on it. So I'm honored to be here. <laughs> cool. Cool. We're awesome. glad to have you. Let me ask, I always mean to ask our guests this, and I usually forget, uh, how did you get into tabletop gaming? Um, my dad introduced me when I was like six years old. Um, my dad has been playing since first edition, um, and oh. uh, his parents gave me like, uh, are you guys familiar with the Imagine X toys? I don't think so. I don't no. think so. Yeah. Um, it came out like right when I was a kid, um, and it's like knights and castles that you can assemble in different ways. And my mom was all worried about, like, violence and that sort of impression. And so my dad said, <laughs> well, let's put it in the context of a story. And so I've been playing D&D since 3.5, since I was six years old. So I have him to thank for my nerdiness. <laughs> That's cool. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the only, the only relatives I've had that uh, were into tabletop gaming are my Aunt Donna and my Uncle Wayne. And we don't talk about them. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. They're... It's They're weird. It's been fun with my family. Like my brother is in high school right now, and uh, as um, as like my mom watched me and my dad playing D and D and watched our brother mm-hmm. get into it too, she was like, "Okay, I see. Like, this isn't just hack and slash. Like, there's intent and story behind it." And now she plays with us too. So we've got cool. a family of nerds. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. The family that plays together s- slays <laughs> together. Slays <laughs> together. Oh, nice. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The. Uh... The only interest any of my family have had in tabletop gaming is my sister to learn about it so she can make fun of me. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, like in a nice, well, nice for her sister way. (laughs) Sure, sure. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's that's really cool. Anything, uh, Jeff, how you doing? (laughs) Oh, 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 is it is it time for that question? (laughs) Is now good enough for you guys? All right, fine. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'm doing I'm doing fine. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was I was planning on doing a lot of baking this weekend, but the uh, mm. the like uh, Skyler got me a stand mixer. Oh yes, I saw that. Uh, however, it is defective, and I have to send it for a replacement. <laughs> oh <laughs> so, no, it's whatever. <laughs> like I that that is literally my job. Is I am I am the guy that the works at that works at my company. That is the guy you you called if something's defective and I send you a new one. Like, so it's like, it's like, I gotcha. can't get away from my own job even in my <laughs> yeah. leisure time. Yeah. So I will do it. So it's, it's fine. It's just, it was just like, you know, frustrating. And then it's like, ah, whatever. I know how this works. Just, sure. I just got to talk to a person and be like, this is broken. This is why I tried all the things. Please send me a new one. And they'll go, okay. Yeah. So is that a, is that a kitchen aid? Yes. Kitchen aid. So, yeah, um, we got one of those for as a wedding present, and like, oh my goodness, I don't use it often, but when I do, there, there's no replacing it. It is <laughs> so, so good. What do you mean no replacing it, Gabe? I need mine replaced. I that's <laughs> okay. Poor, poor choice. <laughs> poor or great choice of words, I right? Guess. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, I, if I can recommend some, uh, some attachments, we have a cheese grater attachment. Ooh. Oh, good idea. And I cannot get over how. It, how hard it is to grate something without an attachment and how easy it is to grate something with an attachment. Well, we got this like hand crank thing for grating cheese and like it works pretty well with as long as it's like a low moisture cheese. This is turning yeah. into a dinner party conflict. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's still like, I don't know, it only comes with like so many different grades that you can like like you can only you can only get it down so small or whatever so sure. yeah i've it's, seen those used but, for like parmesan but not for really anything else just like dusting pasta yeah. and things like that yeah i tried uh some like kobe jack or cheddar and it just turned it just t- turned into mush yeah you know yeah it's, it still made it like usable but it was a pain in the butt to clean after so yeah. Uh, so welcome to dinner party conflict <laughs> yes with our special guest nathan yeah yeah th- th- this is the this is the podcast you wanted to be on right <laughs> right 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 i i like cooking i cook on a grad student's budget so i don't do sure, fancy cooking sure. but... 
Oh, if you want, if you want, uh, uh, you know, fancy ramen ideas, I got a few. <laughs> yeah, you know, I may need that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, poach well, an cool. egg in the noodles. It's amazing. Like, don't That's, don't don't mix it yes. in. Just you poach it just until the 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 yolk gets like just before it gets jammy. Yeah, and then you mix it into the broth, and it's really good. But that, I mean, everybody, everybody's done the egg trick. So yeah, that reminds me. I don't know if uh, if this was actually on your podcast or a different one. I think I heard it on a podcast. Uh, one of Albert Einstein's greatest ideas, according to himself, was hard boiling an egg in his soup so that he could cook two meals at once. <laughs> right. It's gr- it's brilliant. <laughs> See, geniuses know what's up. Yep. That's why I have a poster of them. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> Yep. Cool. Um, I guess uh, just one thing that one thing that I want to say um, next week, I'm going to have an, an announcement that I'm very excited about. Oh, come uh, on. So this is this <laughs> is your um, this is your pre announcement warning. Mm-hmm. It's I the guess. teaser trailer. <laughs> Yes. So what? yeah, next week expect an announcement that probably won't interest most of our listeners, but some of them it will. And I'm very excited about it regardless. Oh, oh! I, I think I just realized what it is. I was like, how yeah, can I, t- you, I told how can you about you it before that? I How can you say that? And I haven't told me anything. But no, you literally just talked about it. Yeah. So, okay. So what is he talking about? He? Sorry, guys. You'll have to wait and wait until next week. Find out. Yeah, it's. I'm. I'm excited for it. All right. Uh, do you guys want to go ahead and uh, jump into this episode? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So I want you to imagine the two of you that. Uh, one day you're in, you're, you're off in the Middle East somewhere and you're walking along. You've got some, I don't know, you're, you've got some sheep or something that you're herding along through the countryside okay. and you actually come across, there's a tomb up ahead that you heard some guy got buried in like three days ago or something. Hmm, okay. And you know, you're just, you're just hanging out, hanging out, talking, whatever. And then you hear a noise and you look over. And the stone seems to have rolled away from the tomb. Ooh. And, you know, you're kind of far away, but like from far away, it looks kind of like you can see like shimmering light coming out from from inside this cave. Sounds magical. Yeah. What do you guys do? I, uh, well, are, so there's, we're, we're two shepherds. Are our sheep okay? Are they freaked out? <laughs> uh, shoot. Let me roll up. Um, <laughs> sure, yeah. I animal grab animal my D100. Checks. Uh, 62. Uh, yeah, your sheep are fine. Okay. Okay. In fact, some of them are kind of wandering over in that direction. So you should, you should probably go and, and rain. Yeah. Back Fluffy. Up. What are you, what are you getting into over there? <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I'm going to make, I, I made this joke last time that I had a, a, a shepherd related, um, dragon's horde intro, but I'll do this again. So you, you get fluffy and then you go and you start, you start counting your sheep and you're like, okay, then one, two, three. Whoa. Whoops. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> so you you get up closer to this uh, to this tomb, and you you peek inside, and you don't see a guy buried in there. Instead, you see a pile of gold and a, like there's rubies and gems, and there's like a flaming sword sticking out of there. Whoa! And then you remember you heard that the guy that got buried was very tall and had <laughs> red scales, <laughs> and you realize that this is not a tomb you have just found. Do you know what this is? What, what is, is a game? This is the Dragon's Whore. Okay. <laughs> I want to apologize, not just to people who might have been offended by the biblical reference, but just to everybody. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> Gabe, not your worst. Gabe, not your worst. It, that's true. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. That was good. <laughs> All right. So today's magic item was submitted by what? See what scribe? That's right. What? Do you actually want to? Do you want to read this, or do you want me to? Sure, I can read it. Um, I might okay. summarize a little bit because it was lengthy. I just tried to specify some of the mechanics and everything, but we sure, can get sure. into that as as we want to. Uh, this is the staff of the deliverer. Uh, after typing it out, I'd say it's a legendary magic item. I was trying to figure out how to rank it. Um, sure. It requires attunement by a cleric or paladin. This staff looks like an unassuming walking stick, uh, but despite its mundane appearance, it has been consecrated by a powerful, good-aligned god. Uh, Lathander or Corellin would fit the bill nicely in the Forgotten Realms setting. 
Uh, the staff has the properties of a plus one quarter staff that cannot be broken except by powerful magic, the equivalent of a sixth level or higher spell. Uh, while attuned to the staff, a creature gains the following static benefits. You cannot be magically charmed. You gain a plus two on all saving throws against spell effects. And I think that alone would make it legendary. So. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you succeed death, sa- uh, death saves on a roll of eight or higher. Um, additionally, the staff has 10 charges. While attuned, you may expend one charge to cause any of the 11 effects to occur. The staff regains 5 charges at dawn, and you can use your bonus action to expend a hit die to give the staff an additional charge. So the 11 abilities you can trigger are Transmute into Serpent. Use an action to throw your staff on the ground. It turns into a giant constrictor snake that acts on its own initiative but follows your mental commands. Uh, when the snake is killed, or when you use your action to touch it, the snake reverts back into a staff. Water to blood. Using an action, you can touch a source of water. That water turns into blood for one hour. Anyone who drinks the blood gains the poisoned condition if they fail a DC 17 con save. Whoa. Okay. Um, summon frogs. Summon gnats. Summon flies. All of these let you summon eight giant frogs, um, four swarms of insects, or four swarms of wasps. And they remain until killed or until one day has passed. I think that's true for... Yeah, that's true for all three of those. Um, Disease the livestock. You can use your action to bring a blight upon livestock. Choose up to 40 cows, bulls, sheep, goats, any farm animal that you can see. Each animal gains the poisoned condition for one day. During this time, they do not yield usable milk, eggs, wool, um, etc. And if Mm -hmm. the animal is slaughtered and later consumed during that period in which they're sickened, then any creature that consumes the blighted animal gains the poisoned condition for one day. Um, Afflict the living. Using your action, you may force each humanoid within 300 feet of you to make a DC 17 con save. Creatures that fail suffer two levels of exhaustion and take 1d4 necrotic damage. This feature cannot give a creature more than five levels of exhaustion. So you can bring them to the brink of death. You cannot kill them. Um, okay. Fire and ice. You can cast either wall of fire or ice storm, each at fifth level. Locusts. You can cast insect plague at fifth level. Darkness. You can cast the darkness spell, but rather than its normal level two version, it has mm-hmm. a radius of 150 feet, uh, and it does not require concentration and lasts for four hours instead of ten minutes. Uh, sure. And finally, Death of the Eldest. You can use your action to summon an avatar of death with the stats of a revenant. The creature, known as the Destroyer, seeks out the firstborn male of every household it can find and kills him. However, the Destroyer passes by households with door frames that have been consecrated by a religious figure, or covered in holy water or holy oil, or slathered in the blood of a year-old lamb ritually slaughtered. Which, like... The Old Testament is messed up. The amount of, like, crazy (laughs) rituals that are in... Anyway, um, the Destroyer cannot be dismissed by you, even though you summoned it, but it vanishes of its own accord when every firstborn male of an unconsecrated household within the town or city is killed. Uh, If the Destroyer is killed and its rejuvenation ability is prevented, then it does not respawn. There you go. Well done. Uh, Yeah, so... (laughs) There, there's a lot here. Um, we usually try... I usually, when we ha- have um, items submitted, I usually aim for ones that are shorter just because it's easier to discuss like a couple things rather than a bunch of things. But that's uh, that's not at all to say this is not... This is a great item. Um, Thank you. you. Know, I want to make that clear. This is all real. This has a lot of really cool stuff. Thank you. First thing that comes to mind is the staff can't be broken except by a sixth or high lo- higher level spell. That's really cool. I really like that. Thank you. In one of the Dragonlance books, there was a character that had a staff that was given to him by his god or something, and it was similarly uh, unbreakable. And I just, I love that. I even used that exact thing in one of the fantasy fictions that I wrote, the one that I one that I released on the main feed of the podcast a couple of years ago. I gave a character a, an unbreakable staff just because I think it's a, that's a really neat thematic thing. Yeah. Um, the abilities that it gives you, the static abilities, the inability to become charmed, the bonus on saves against spells, the easier death saving throws, that's all really cool. And yeah, definitely like with all this stuff, there's definitely a legendary item because this yeah, there's a lot of stuff that it you gives know, you. I might even bump it up to artifact. Like as I was reading it, you know, as I wrote sure. it out, I was just kind of brainstorming and reading it back, I'm thinking, that's a lot more powerful than I realized it was. So Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Legendary might 
even might not cut it. Like we could we could make it an artifact. Sure. Um, and then <laughs> when you're reading the transmute into serpent, the thing that came to mind for me was sticks to snakes. <laughs> sticks to snakes. Oh my god. That was a, that was a spell in earlier editions of D and D. The D and D arcade game. Uh, that's one of the abilities. That's one of the best abilities that the yeah. cleric character gets. Yeah. That's awesome. Is that you just, know that. You just throw out a bunch of sticks that then turn into snakes and then attack the enemies. For you. <laughs> oh my god! Like the character yells out, "Sticks to snakes!" Yeah, <laughs> like it's really yeah. good. Because um, uh, I think it's um, it's important to point out that a lot of the cleric abilities in earlier editions of D anD D were based on stuff from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's that. The clerics have the contagion ability for this exact reason. Um, you know, a ton of stuff that clerics can do is reminiscent of the plagues and and so on. Right. Um, so it's it's very apt that uh, that you know that would yeah. that that would be in there. Yeah, it's it's hard to make an item that is like based off of uh, like you know literature and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And not make it like an artifact because like you're yeah. you're trying to. <laughs> Yeah, you know, trying to put mechanics to something that has been told over and over in, in many in many stories, like yeah, yeah. it's it, it's really hard not to like give it every everything, you know that it's got, you know. So like it, it, it you weren't you weren't gonna get away from legendary artifact with this, <laughs> but you did an outstanding job on it. Well, thank you. Yeah, um, and I love the summoning a revenant that even you can't dismiss. Yeah, it's there until it completes its its thing. That's really cool. Thank you. I imagine players like doing that and then regretting it thinking wait now we need to go and stop this because sure, the sure. rejuvenation ability is like it um infests another corpse and then comes back to life 24 hours later and only a wish okay, spell yeah. can prevent it in fifth edition well dang yeah so um yeah overall i think this is a really cool item the theming is definitely really cool and just the stuff it does that's it's great i would i would definitely uh definitely love that as a player and i'd like to throw that into a game and see what the players do with it oh, thank you i like i liked the touch of being able to expend a hit die to get an additional charge oh shoot yes yeah. that is awesome thank you yeah i was like i was like oh yeah more uses for hit die that's great always like that man that even that's a great idea for just how to i feel like that's that's a thing that should be part of the game you know what i'm saying like the idea of someone giving up their life force in order to make a magic item more powerful. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's great. That, that should already be in there. That's such a good a good addition to the game. Yeah, I can see that being like a thing with like stabs and, uh, and wands or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even like swords like the Nine Life Stealer feels very appropriate to mm -hmm. have something like that. Sure. Uh, yeah, so um, I don't really have much else to say about this. Did either of the, the two of you? I think it largely speaks for itself. It's it's a yeah, great no, item. It's got a lot of work put into it. Clearly, yeah. No, I yeah, I appreciate all the all the uh, all the detail and everything. And like, yeah, you, you did a good job putting in all the all the you know the plagues <laughs> and stuff. It's really cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, so thank you very much, Nathan, for bringing that in once again. That was the staff of the deliverer. So Jeff, if anybody else wanted to be like Nathan and submit magic items to the Dragon's Horde or they wanted to submit uh, questions for us to discuss or stories for the funeral pyre or whatever else we're doing with that segment, <laughs> how would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com or join us on our interparty discord at bit.ly slash interparty discord. That's correct. And Nathan, is there anything that you would like to direct our listeners to? Is there anywhere people can find you or anything else that you've made on the internet that you want to uh, direct them to? Yeah, sure. Um, thank you for asking. I'm uh, working on uh, multiple novels right now. A couple of them are getting close to the point where I'm going to start seeking out an agent soon. Um, but short stories and poetry and some D&D content is available at nathanheardwords.com. Uh, um, cool. Heard as in like, I heard what you said. Um, sure. Yeah, I don't have a separate... I'll put, a, I'll put that in the show notes. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, eventually I will have a separate website for Seawood Scribe, but again, grad school budget, can't do that right now. <laughs> so <laughs> sure. it's all, everything is lumped under nathanherdwords.com. Awesome. Cool. That's uh, that's really cool. Well, so before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give away today. As we have been for the last few weeks, we're giving away a copy of the uh, supplements from Crit Academy, the Warmind, the Skybreaker, and the Werecat. And as we learned last week, apparently a few other things too. I guess Justin has been sending out additional ones on top of those three. So a oh, big right, thank yeah. you to Justin from Crit Academy. Um, 
yeah, so so these are some character options, a couple subclasses, a couple race options. So, Jeff, who is our winner of these great supplements today? Our winner today is Carl L. Whoa, 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 winner. winner. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Yes, congratulations, Carl L. You should be getting those in your email pretty soon. Uh, if you don't within the next week or so, let us know. And uh, be sure to leave Crit Academy reviews. You know, the more reviews they get, the more attention they get. Also, the more they know to work on and improve in the future. So, uh, yeah, please, please, please leave reviews for Crit Academy. I believe each of these supplements can be given an individual review. So at least one of them, please. That's yeah. that's all we ask in return for, <laughs> uh, for getting these great supplements. So big, huge thank you to Crit Academy. Congratulations, Carl L. Jeff, if anybody else wanted to enter this drawing and they wanted to get a free copy of these at least three supplements, <laughs> how would they enter the drawing? These three plus supper, supplements. Three plus supplements, yes. They can send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with Crit 3 in the subject line. There you go. I also want to direct all of you to our Patreon. Patreon is an online platform where you can pledge to donate a certain amount of money per month to the creator of your choice. If you go to ours, we've got various rewards on different tiers. We've got outtakes. We've got a bunch of fantasy fiction that I've written. Uh, we have a monthly bonus podcast, Interpatron Conflict, where we discuss a variety of topics uh, to go along with our April Fool's episode this year. Um, last month's episode was about our favorite commercials. So we talked about some of our favorite commercials for uh, for about an hour. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the top tier, we have a monthly Roll20 game. Nathan actually just joined our Roll20 game last month. So we're happy to, uh, happy to have you. Yeah, it was super fun. I'm glad to be a player again. It's been, been a long time. Cool. And so I think... I think the next episode or the, the next Roll20 session is going to be uh, about a week after this episode goes out. So, um, yeah, so it's there's still time if you would like to join, even if you want to join at a lower tier. Every little bit helps. We're really appreciative to everybody who has supported us over the years, especially in the last year or so. Um, if you can't afford to or you just don't want to, no worries. The fact that you're listening is enough. You know, that's that's awesome. And, uh, you know, just keep being awesome, everybody. So, yeah, thank you. so if you would like to support us monetarily, though, check out, check us out at patreon.com slash interparty conflict. There's a few different tiers. So even a dollar a month can help out the show and get some cool stuff in return. And then one more quick thing, check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. Check out Crit Academy at critacademy.com. Justin, Ian, and Austin make new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. Also check out uh, d, d Character Lab. They've been getting a little bit of, uh, of new content out uh, in the last few weeks. And then check out uh, Brute Force and Ignorance and the Kind GM podcast as well. So enough of all of that. Let's get into some questions. Okay, our first question comes from Ren10314 on Reddit. And they ask, why do you think so many people play campaigns where magic is illegal or in some way limited? Yeah. Um, Nathan, do you want to start us out? Sure. So... I know that I'm in the minority in the inter-party conflict community on Discord and whatever else, but I actually do really enjoy sure. low magic campaigns or limited magic campaigns. So mm -hmm. yeah. um, why do people play uh, limited magic campaigns? I think that it makes the uh, DM's job easier. There's a lot less variables mm -hmm. to contend with. Um, yeah. And so, well, okay, first... Players should always, like, be on board for it. And so, like, that's a session zero discussion. If the yeah. DM and players are all on board for a low magic campaign, then great. But if some of them aren't, then either, like, maybe players should sit out that game or maybe the DM should table it for a different group of people some other time. But assuming everyone is on board for it, it makes the DM's job easier. There's fewer variables. And uh, uh, the players, I think, can feel like... Um, can really get some heroic moments when they take down monsters or magic wielding villains when they themselves do not have magic or have really limited access to magic. Um, okay. There's, there's a larger obstacle to overcome. And as a result, you can get kind of a, um, a larger satisfaction from doing it. Sure. Hmm. Yeah. It, this definitely is not something that should be sprung on the players after the campaign has started. Right. Uh, like you were saying, it should definitely be a session zero. The DM explains, this is what I want for this campaign. And then the players, assuming they are interested, they act accordingly. Um, yeah, that would be, that'd be awful if, like, 
I don't know, three sessions in, the DM was like, oh, wait, no, no, you, sorry, you can't be a, can't be a wizard. There's, there's yeah. no magic. In this <laughs> no, I, I made my character to be a wizard. You can't just take away all my spell book now. Yeah, that's right, right. definitely a session zero thing. Now, yeah. I, now, okay, so definitely if it's like, if it's supposed to be completely low magic, every like just the whole the world setting and everything is supposed to be low magic, then yeah, that definitely needs to be brought up uh, like session zero, zero or at least, you know, or before the characters are made. Sure. But this all sparked the idea of like, it, it would be interesting that the campaign is taking place during a transition from high magic to low magic. Like okay. in the world, there is a, an event happening that is like, getting rid of the magic in some way maybe like you know from at the beginning like oh everybody's like you know going on about uh your typical D D experience and then suddenly yeah there's this like um i don't know this organization that's going around and like capturing all the mages or something or you know it's sure. like or like the 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 monarchy is decided to outlaw all magic or something so now they have now the players have to deal with that but it's not like the game isn't low magic it's just you're you're it's sort of like the the world is sort of transitioning into more low magic and it's you have to kind of deal with that as as the player so like it could be an interesting surprise like within the game but like as like as far as the game as a whole like yeah i don't yeah you don't want to you don't want to be like oh no 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 you you can't cast over a third level spell even though you've you know built a character around you know being able to cast whatever yeah that's a good distinction like um in the example you were talking about like that would be a campaign where all of the options for spells and stuff are still available to the players but within the story yeah. they might meet ramifications for using magic yeah sure yeah it'd be, yeah, be kind of neat to kind of like if you're in a if you're in a battle or something but there's like bystanders like you might not want to cast that fireball because it might draw a little bit too much attention from outside forces sure I've never I've never seen a game where magic was illegal and like if it is part of the story but the players are still their options are still there. Um I think that's really interesting like like what you were saying Jeff that would be a really cool idea for a campaign where it's like this is a thing that the world is going through and and having to deal with that could lead to, you know, a lot of interesting role playing, a lot of interesting gameplay. Mm-hmm. Um much more often I've seen groups where magic is limited in that like oh if you're a spellcaster you have to make additional checks every time you try to cast a spell um i've been in at least one group that did that and uh you know i can speculate as to the dm's motivations but like it really made spellcasting not fun yeah i i chose to be a spellcaster despite you know i knew the the limitations going in and i chose to do it because i thought this could be really cool if Magic is really limited, but I'm still able to have fun with it. However, in the end, it ended up not being fun. And I really ended up wishing, like most players do, I'm sure, that I had just made a fighter or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, human fighters are actually very fun, despite their yep. like low reputation. They're very fun. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, no, no, no complaint from me on that. Um, could I take a couple minutes to kind of talk about a couple low magic settings that I have run yeah. as a DM? Sure. Absolutely. Go for yeah. it. Okay, great. So it started with a marathon session that I ran with a bunch of my buddies in uh, senior year of high school. Um, Mm -hmm. It was like winter break. We took 30 hours, maybe six of which were us like passed out on my living room floor. Um, (laughs) And uh, they came with no like expectations ahead of time. I had made 10 or so. No, there were, there were 10 players actually, which Never doing that again. That was too much. It's a lot but of players. <laughs> there were there were about twenty five PCs that I had made, all level three, so easy enough to like grab and kind of get into. Um, and uh, the players just kind of grabbed minis and then got their stats accordingly, and then had to kind of figure out who they were uh, as we were going. And that way, like every time someone died, they just grabbed a new mini and kept going. Um, <laughs> and so there were a lot of different factions warring over Waterdeep as they are wont to do. Um, and it ended with a couple Zentarim agents um, and a, a warlock of Asmodeus or Asmodeus uh, mm-hmm. kind of teaming up and managing to communicate covertly without the Harpers figuring it out. 
and then they essentially nuked Waterdeep, killed Bahamut, and took over the world. Oh my. Yeah, and so I was like, well, that was an experience. I'm not sure that I want to leave the story where, like, the bad guys, like, decimate everything and everyone. So, like, a few months later, um, 80 years later in the story, I got together a group of four friends and uh, said, okay, we're going to play the sequel to that game. And uh, because Bahamut has died, the uh, cosmic and divine magic has, like, become tainted because there's an imbalance in like the godly forces sure and so magic will corrupt you and potentially turn you evil and so my brother was like okay i'm gonna be a monk um and i'll be a shadow monk i'll like kind of flirt with the edges but it won't be like magic magic and uh, i had a couple people be like fighters and rogues and then one of my friends said i want to be a sorcerer and i said okay we'll do that um yeah and uh, he chose the draconic bu- uh, bloodline and then throughout the whole campaign, which lasted four years, like on and off as we were able to. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, it was... Good job. Thank you. It, it was my like pr- best probably for my whole life before and since. Like I don't think I will reach this level again, but it was a wonderful, sure. wonderful campaign. So unbeknownst to the player who uh, was the Draconic Bloodline Sorcerer, he was the reincarnation of Bahamut. Um, and oh. so magic did not corrupt him. He was able to use it all freely. But because it was so ingrained into all of the players, they kept telling him to not cast that spell and to like be careful and subtle. And um, and so there were lots of mages they fought and lots of dragons that they fought, and the dragons always kind of flew away because they got scared and the players were not really sure what was going on. Um, funny, this actually ties back to your um, Dragon Sword intro. The entire okay. thing was kind of... <laughs> a parable of uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because the draconic sorcerer, in order to reincarnate himself as Bahamut, had to die and then sprout forth as a resurrected dragon. And so it's like almost exactly (laughs) what you said there. But anyway, like that whole, um, that whole campaign was really fun because like, again, it was a session zero, like expectation that was set. And uh, I really think that the players enjoyed like, um, the challenge of fighting against magic users without using magic themselves, aside from their sorcerer friend. Sure. Um, yeah, I actually I reduced them all to tears at the end. They thought they had lost, and then he like <laughs> resurrected, and they all got their like level twenty powers. Um, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, nice. it was super fun. Yeah, I I also really like I like when it is part of the story, part of the world that magic is some way limited but again it is important that the players are still i mean in my opinion in my opinion it's still important that the players still have they can choose to do a certain they can choose to play a spellcaster just story-wise there's going to be ramifications or whatever um i remember a while ago i read one of the the first dragon lance novel i don't know how familiar either of you guys are with dragon lance not super familiar Um, it takes place in a world where there are there is magic so it's, it's not exactly a perfect example of this. There is magic, but the only magic is arcane magic. There are stories of there having been gods in the past, but those they're just, they're old stories. Like everybody know, everybody knows there's no gods. There have, have, you know, even the, the legends only say that there were gods until like 500 years ago or whatever. Hmm. And then the story continues for a little while. This group of adventurers get together. They go looking for blah, blah, whatever. And then uh, one of the characters I could be remembering this wrong, but I think this character dies and then comes back from the dead as the world's first cleric in like 500 years or whatever. So like whatever it was that was keeping the gods away has just been had like a little pinhole poked in it. And so from then the gods start coming back into the world and something involving dragons. I don't know. But (laughs) if it's part of the story, like you were saying, Nathan, um, I love the idea of one of the players being, you know, the one spellcaster or whatever, or, or not necessarily, this isn't exactly what was going on in your story, but if a player was one of the incredibly rare spellcasters or was the reincarnation of, of a deity or something like that, that's a really cool thing to play with. And I'm definitely down for it. If that's what the DM has in mind in the situations that I've personally been a part of, or 
that I've seen, I feel like most of the time it's just that the DM doesn't want spellcasters. Like for whatever yeah. reason, they think spellcasting is either too powerful or too much work to keep track of or something. And if that's the motivation behind it, I'm not really on board. Yeah, I think uh, there's sense. other ways to do that. But I don't know. So that that's why I think a lot of people play campaigns like that is because the DM either thinks that it makes the characters too powerful or possibly breaks the fiction or something. You know, a, a lot of players think of PCs as like the all the magic abilities and stuff they have as they're basically like superheroes. And how do you challenge superheroes? Or more importantly, how do you make a compelling story where the characters have all of these magic abilities? And I can understand that. So, you know, if, if that's the motivation behind this, you know, I'm not completely against it, but uh, I don't know. I just, I just feel like I, I play a normal person every day in my real life. So it, <laughs> yeah. when I play D and D, I want to play a larger than life person who's slinging fireballs and whatever, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I can, I can understand. Like there's, there is a romance to, to low magic stuff. And like, yeah. Cause like when the magic does show up, it's that much more special and cool sure. in the story. So like, you know, I, I like, I do like low magic, to, but when the high magic gets introduced into it somehow, mm-hmm. or, or like we were saying, like, you know, it'd be, maybe it starts off high magic, but then transitions into low magic. And then like the players have to adapt to it. Yeah. Sure. The one other um, low magic campaign that I've run was set in uh, late 1500s Europe. And okay. uh, it started out with no magic and no monsters, but the players like stumbled upon an allosaurus and they were like this is weird this shouldn't happen (laughs) and uh, like over the first couple sessions of the campaign they actually like reawakened magic and monsters across all of christendom and then the rest of the campaign was having to like contend with that um fun fact the tarasque in DD originated from a like local uh, legend in southeast France in a small town called Tarascon. Right, yeah, I've, I've heard that before. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the uh, Tarascon was like the main town in that campaign, and it ended with them like awakening the Tarask and <laughs> beseeching it for help to go fight the other monsters. It was very much like Godzilla meets <laughs> sure. meets like uh, early modern Europe. It was really fun. That's, That's really cool. Good. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, our next question comes from Ravel G on email, and they ask, how would you make a game of D&D more gritty and realistic while still having fun and make players feel more like real-world heroes and less like demigods? Yeah, so I, I kind of feel like this is the motivation behind a lot of people that do try to run low magic campaigns. Um, I think that, the motiva- again, the motivation is that they want the players to feel more grounded and less... Like they're uh, some half dragon throwing around fireballs or whatever. That's one way. One approach, I guess, is to make magic more limited, more more uh, rare. Mm. Uh, but yeah, do you guys have any other ideas for how to how to make a game more gritty and realistic while still being fun? Yeah, well, within D and D, I mean, if it's part of a session zero conversation, you could mm-hmm. restrict certain classes or subclasses. Like, I feel like the grittiest spellcaster is probably actually the wizard because it's reliant upon like study and notes. And if you lose them or they get burned, then you've got to start over Um, as opposed to the warlock and sorcerer being able to just use whatever they want, kind of whenever they want, as long as they have spell slots. Um, But for all classes, like use, use exhaustion a lot more. Um, Sure. I, I got this tip from Crit Academy, and I've been using it ever since. But when okay. uh, when someone falls unconscious in combat and gets back up, yeah. they get a level of exhaustion. Um, sure. Yeah, that, that's a common house rule, and that definitely definitely makes it feel more uh, more gritty, more... I was going to say realistic. I mean, it's yeah. uh, it definitely makes it feel more punishing. Yes, yes. Uh, but, not, but not overly so. Right, because yeah. it, it affects all classes equally rather than specifically punishing spellcasters other than them sure. like, having sure. fewer hit points. Yeah. Uh Pathfinder second edition, I don't know if any I don't know much about the first edition, but they had they added enough uh, a thing that's like wounded. No, not wounded. I can't remember. It's just any time you go down 
and you get back up, you have like a stack of this, you know, this effect that the next time you go down, you are you are already one step closer to death. So like you basically automatically fail your first death save. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Although I think what fifth edition, I think your your failed death saves stick around until you get a full rest or something. But um, uh, I believe I don't think they do. I believe like, they reset every time you go down. Yeah. I th- I think that's another common house rule. Right. Is you can't fail three within a long rest or whatever. Like that's I think that's a common house rule. Sure. Yeah, that's one I've used yeah. before. Um, yeah, but no, the exhaustion thing. I, like yeah, exhaustion exhaustion is rough. Yeah. And like I don't I don't know. I, I I wouldn't say it should be used a lot more, but yeah, it definitely. I feel like it should, it, it could be used more, and that's a, and that's a good that that is a good idea of when you go down and come back up, you have a level of exhaustion. That's that's pretty good. Sure. Yeah, exhaustion can get tough really fast because you only remove one layer per long rest. Oh boy, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, I feel like one thing that you can do with with making as few changes to the rules as possible. One thing that you can you can do is just really crack down on a lot of the things you are probably glossing over. So things like rations, you know, whether your characters are eating enough, whether they have enough food and water to uh, sustain them, um, keeping track of that, keeping track, make sure you keep track of spell slots. If you are aware that, so everybody's aware, like Nathan, you were saying that uh, if a wizard loses their spell book, they don't have their spells or, you know, it it, it is definitely a huge uh, detriment to them. But let me ask, how many times you've been in a game where the wizard lost their spellbook? You know, it it, it may, maybe maybe it's happened to some of you before, but that's definitely something that I think a lot of DMs just kind of ignore. And hey, that's fine. I I don't really ever plan on making the wizard lose their spellbook, but if you really do focus on something like that, that can make the game feel more gritty and realistic, and it's it can also make the players feel more like. Uh, scrappy heroes rather than demigods. If the wizard can just throw out fireballs whenever they want, that's one thing. But if they know I only have this power because I have this book and I have to do everything I can to keep this book from getting stolen or destroyed, that in and of itself is going to make them feel less like a demigod. Now, that's that's only wizards, but again, just keeping track of the things that you are probably glossing over if you keep track of spell components, not just like the material components, but also the verbal components, the somatic components. If they know that they're going to be making sound whenever they cast a spell, that limits the situations where they can cast spells. If you are making sure that they have their one hand with their spell focus or their material components or whatever, or you make sure that they have their costly material components instead of just deducting some gold from their you know, running tally of gold, those sorts of things do draw more attention to the, you know, the grittiness of the campaign. A lot of the time when you are feeling like everybody's just super powerful demigods throwing around fireballs, I I feel like a lot of the time it's going to be because you are willingly glossing over some of the things that do make them feel more grounded. And, hey, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I gloss over these things too. I don't want to worry about how much uh, carrying capacity the players have. I don't care. I don't want them to be be aware of how many rations they have on them. But if your intention is to make the game feel more gritty and realistic, it can be as simple as just making sure, okay, which pocket do you have these items in? You have a backpack. Are they just all in the same compartment of the bag? Did you leave it in the inn while you went out to go like scrounge around the thieves guild? There you go. Like you probably don't have your 50 foot of rope on you. You can't, you can't just climb down. <laughs> exactly. Who has the party's treasure? Like who has that group loot? Who's carrying it? What did you do with it when you were sleeping? And so on. So even just a mat, just a matter of like focusing on those types of things can g- lend an air of grit or an air of realism to your game. Yeah. See, this this all seems like a lot of boring homework. <laughs> that's yeah. I mean, that's true, <laughs> but I'm not saying that's not, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock it. Cause I do enjoy that kind of stuff. Honestly. Uh, I feel like visual aids are good. Sure. Like <laughs> even to the point of like, you can have like little miniatures of even your gear or something and just like, make sure it's like, you, there's only so many <laughs> slots in the wagon or whatever, you know, bring, yeah. make sure yeah. you bring in, you know, like, okay, we need that. We need that 
coil of uh, a 50 foot coil of rope okay that's that's got to go in the wagon for sure we need rope everyone needs rope sure like what else can we what else can we put in so like maybe there is like a little like you you can make a little game out of the daily prep uh for the you know the party going on an adventure or something like that just sure just so like the the bookkeeping is a little bit more interactive and fun yeah, I think um, visuals would help that be a lot less homeworky because that is yeah, a tough sure. balance to strike. Um, I thought I had of maybe not maybe not as realistic, but 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 gritty for sure. Um, or it, it, something that's not necessarily mechanic mechanics. Um, making the players feel. I mean, like they're still going to be powerful. They're still going to have all mm-hmm. their class abilities, but making them feel powerless by like making like their failures real and their or or like making their choices harder um you know like yes they have all these powers and they can they can um they can conjure food for themselves really easily but if they're walking through a town of people who are starving to death like sure and it's like you can only conjure so much food in a day you only have so many slots you can't just stay here and conjure food for the rest of your life to keep these people to keep these people fed you know, like that, that can make them feel like crap. I can't just fix everything with these, with this magic. I have to go and do something. I have to like, you know, I have to go and confront the, the, you know, the monarch or whatever. And, you know, try to figure this out. So like, I, yeah, I feel like there are some story ways that you can, you know, put in some realism and and grittiness without, without affecting the mechanics of, or, you know, the abilities of the players directly. Yeah. Like making the story grounded, yeah. Is is definitely a good way to uh, to make the players feel more like they're dealing with real problems. Yeah, and think about like how much you can do with just narration. Like, are they in a desert? Talk about the amount of sand that gets like in their clothes and their shoes. If they're sure. <laughs> in a forest, like have someone stumble into poison ivy, and there's no like mechanical detriment, but they have an itchy rash. And um, when they finally do get to a town and they smell like f- real food with butter and spices and stuff as opposed to like <laughs> yeah. beef jerky it, it'll hit differently sure sure yeah yeah like yeah descriptions like that can inspire um can inspire players to you know interact in the story more and, and like do more role playing and stuff because yeah when when you describe the start like the the when you describe their thirst and hunger as they travel through the desert and then you describe a delicious buttery bread uh <laughs> You know, yeah, they're they're gonna be like, oh, my my character starts salivating and runs towards the smell, and it's like, all right, yeah, let's let's see where that goes. Yeah, I feel like another thing that can um, that can make the game feel more gritty and realistic is just really hammering down on consequences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think it was Nathan earlier talking about uh, collateral damage of like throwing around. I mean, there's been a lot of talk of throwing around fireballs mostly for me, but. Um, <laughs> If if the players do have to deal with the fact that when they got into that fight, they dealt damage to a building around them by using area effects, or if there are if there are are people around them while they're fighting and people are getting you know they're trying to get away from the fight, but there's going to be collateral damage from some of the attacks or some of the spells and such. Uh, that can be a way to you know enforce a little bit of the 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 gritty feel to it. Um, also, if you keep track of when the players get up at the at the beginning of the day and like what their morning routine is, if the cleric has to prepare their spells at a specific time, if you enforce that, if there is then some sort of a wrinkle that makes that too difficult, if they get attacked during the time that the wizard would be preparing their spells or the cleric would be preparing their spells, uh, that sort of thing, you know, enforcing the consequences of playing a character that has these abilities that can make it feel a little bit grittier as well. You know, just just being more aware of all of the grit that is in the game can make the game feel grittier. Yeah, it's a they're like like an ambush in the morning routine, you know, like sure. you, you you disrupt their preparations uh like in a world where ever, like a lot of people have spell casting and everyone has their own preparation routine like everybody knows like oh yeah we prepare our still spells at the beginning of the day like it, you know it's maybe not something like you know the the characters in the world think of mechanically but it's like oh everybody prepares their spells at the beginning of the day that's just a, sure. that's just sort of like a common thing so like the enemies might know like oh if we attack them first thing in the morning they won't have their spells prepared 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, you might, you might like throw that in at some point. And so like, maybe, maybe the players now have to be like, all right, well, you know, we, we got to start taking our long rests, you know, earlier or later or something to throw off the enemy. Sure. Yeah. A couple other, um, mechanics within D and D that often get overlooked. Um, I mean, the main one is hit dice. You are supposed to only regain half of your hit dice every long rest. Um, yeah. And most people just do full and that's fine. But if you want to go gritty, then follow that rule. Um, there's also in the DMG, there's a chapter on making games like grittier or more heroic. Um, yeah. And I've never done either of these because they're so extreme. But on one yeah, hand, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. On one hand, you can do epic heroism, which is like a short rest is five minutes and a long rest is. Uh, I actually can't remember it. It might still be a day for that um, for story or like an evening for story purposes. Sure. Um, but that feels more like fourth edition to me, which is fine, but not really my yeah. play style. Um, and uh, gritty realism in the DMG is like a short rest is 24 hours. Yep. And a long rest is seven days. Oh, yeah. oh boy. <sighs> that I've heard of people that use that and that does not appeal to me at all. <laughs> it, I, I might try it for like a specifically political intrigue game. But that is okay. the only context in which I would attempt that. That just yeah. sounds exhausting. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like it might not it might not make a difference <laughs> just because it's the it's the it's the number that we're giving to the downtime. So like like if yeah. the, the DM might just be adjusting everything to go to go around that anyway. It's like I don't know. I don't know. Like I guess I guess it's just it's more risky when you're trying to deal like in a, with an immediate threat that needs to be taken care of in the next 24 hours. You have to make yeah. sure you can do it within a short rest. But yeah, if the idea is that a wrong rest takes seven days, your um, your spells would only renew once every seven days. I think I've just talked myself out of trying this. There's no oh, way man, that would yeah. be, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about like hit points and stuff, but no, yeah, that's yeah, oh. that's a good point. That's ridiculous. Uh, yeah. maybe, maybe that's a, uh, like, that could be a, that could be an interesting idea if you give the the players more like slots, I guess, you know, but then yeah. that, I guess that really only benefits the, the, that only, only really affects the spell casters, but not, not, well, they have more uses per day or more uses per long rest. Maybe. Um, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you you really hit the nail on the head, Jeff, in that, like, that sort of change is only going to affect, it's only going to be an issue if the DM has a play style that requires it. Right. Because, yeah, if it's, hey, full disclosure, in our Roll20 games, I do not run a gritty game at all. I pretty much always, when we start the session, I'm like, yeah, everybody's at full. I'm less concerned about the long term. I'm more concerned about just whatever that session has going on. So that... My the games that I'm running for Roll Twenty would not really be affected by this because I would I would probably naturally just be like uh, okay so the next thing happens a week later instead of a day later. <laughs> yeah, there there were consequences to our actions though, and I appreciated that. Like um, I lit a carriage on fire thinking that it was abandoned <laughs> uh, to yeah. cause a distraction, and then later I heard some guy yelling "My cabbages!" and I was like, "No, <laughs> oh, no right, not yeah, the yeah, cabbage yeah. guy." No, yeah. that poor guy yeah. never gets a break. No, never. And I was I was responsible for it. <laughs> <laughs> never gets a break, even outside of the. Uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I I guess with with that sort of thing, it I think the intention there with with making the the rests take longer. I think the intention then is to say that like, well, we. Yeah, there's a there's a time limit. We don't have time to make a to take a long rest. So I guess we'll just keep going even though we don't have our slots. Right. And yeah, I mean I, I guess that that works for some types of stories. Uh but then you run into the problem of if it's not balanced with the players having all their stuff back, then they're just gonna be running into a meat grinder, you know? Like I I mean, I feel like I'm sure this is not the case for everybody, but I feel like when I choose to use a spell slot for something, it's not because, well, you know, I could get by without this spell slot. I'll go ahead and spell, spend the spell slot anyway. I feel like when I use a spell slot, it's because we are in a challenge 
if I don't use this spell slot, I'm going to lose more resources somewhere else, such as hit points. So extending the amount of time before I'm able to get spell slots back is just going to mean I just can't fight or I'm going to die. <laughs> yep. Maybe that maybe I don't know the nuance involved in building encounters in this type of a game where long rests take so long. It's very possible. I don't know. But mm. uh, I don't know. See, that just sounds sounds abhorrent to me. See, my decision uh, to use a spell slot is uh, do I have do I have lightning bolt prepared? Are there guys standing <laughs> in the line? I'm casting yeah. lightning bolt like yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> It's like if there's an opportunity, um, it's like, oh, a bunch of guys clumped together. Uh, are they immune to fire? Yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. Um, I, I also feel like I've heard that people reduce or eliminate the hit points regained on a long rest. So like even if a long rest is still every, you know, still eight hours or whatever, um, a lot of people don't like the fact that you regain all your hit points. They mm. liked it better in previous editions where you got back a small amount, and then the rest had to be supplemented by the cleric. And that's fine, I guess, but then it just means the cleric is that much more important, is is that much more vital to the the idea of being an adventuring party. And I would rather there be a game where you don't necessarily need a cleric because at, after a long rest, everybody will be back up at full, so feel free to play whatever you want. Well, I mean, the other thing you can do is like, not give anyone back their hit points, but give them back all of their hit dice. Um, and so okay. then they... Okay. Mathematically, that comes out pretty close to giving them back all of their hit points and half their hit dice. But depending sure. on, like, how long, how many days in a row they have to do that, like, um, they they might feel the effects of that without relying on a cleric too heavily. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. Uh, another thing that I've done in the past for short games is I've used... Um, what are they called? Uh, medical kits and like you can't expend a hit die to regain hit points without using a medical kit and oh uh, i see okay yeah like the intent was to make it more gritty but it turned out making it more video gamey like you have to go collect the little vial to so yeah it's yeah. it's fine it's a fun way to play it doesn't necessarily have the gritty effect that is intended yeah um i feel like at the end of the day whether the game is gritty and realistic is really just gonna depend on the mindset of the people playing uh, you can yep. do things to change some of the mechanics, but if if everybody is viewing it as a gamey thing, it's going to feel more like a gamey thing no matter what you do. Yeah. So. Um, I know the question was specifically about D&D, but um, mm-hmm. have either of you played the uh, Zweilander, Zweilander RPG? I have not. No. Okay. I have not either. I will be st- uh, starting a game soon as a player. Um, cool. But yeah, I'm excited for it. My understanding is that it is kind of a response to this phenomenon of people like trying to play D&D but wanting lower magic or more gritty games like it's supposed to feel more like Game of Thrones than The Wheel of Time. Um, sure. So it's yeah, it's like a fantasy based role playing system with like highly lethal rules and players or not players, PCs die pretty frequently. So <laughs> I hope the players don't die. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, yeah. It's not a, SAO intense. or anything like that. That but, is um, gritty. Yeah. Very great. Like live action role playing. But if you die, you die. <laughs> if you die in the game, you die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I mean, I'll, I'll post on the discord, like as I'm playing it, just kind of update with rules and stuff, but cool. Yeah. Like, like if, uh, uh, Ravel G, if you're looking for a gritty D and D game, check out Zweelander, see if it fits the bill better. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find a, a link to put in the show notes about that. Oh, what, one more thing that just came to mind, uh, kind of like, kind of reminded me, what you were just saying, Nathan, kind of reminded me of this, is um, a, there are a lot of different rules out there for vitality and wound points. A, another problem that a lot of people have with the whole hit point system is just that, you know, oh, well, I can get stabbed however many times and my character doesn't take any negative effects and they're still, you know, the still standing and they can get all their hit points back and so on. Uh, There is an alternate version of hit points that people have used where it's split into two pools. One is vitality points and those come back pretty easily, but are not actual injuries, not explicitly injuries. They are more uh, fatigue and, and that sort of thing. And then wound points are the actual physical injuries that you're able to take before you die. And wound points take a really, take a lot longer to come back. And I think there's, Usually something that, like, if you get a critical hit, it hits their wound hit points instead of their 
vitality hit points. So the idea being that all those times that you're getting quote unquote hit with that sword or bitten by that dragon, it's not actually make it's not actually injuring you. It's just using up your vitality because you're fighting it off. You're you're you know pushing it aside. You're getting fatigued. But then like that when it gets that that so when you get hit with that lucky arrow that goes through the chink in your armor, that actually is an injury and that took off three quarters of your wounds or something. So, so a system like that might be, might be more like what some of these people are yeah, looking for. I actually like that. I might have to experiment with that. <laughs> okay, I'm sure. I don't think it's in the Dungeon Master's Guide. I don't think there's an official fifth yeah. edition Vitality and Wound Points. I remember there being in the third edition um, Unearthed Arcana. It was okay. in there. Yeah. So there's probably something similar for fifth edition out right now. Okay, yeah, I know, I know yeah. Pathfinder Two has like stamina mechanic, like a, like an alternate. Uh, hit point thing where it's like it mm-hmm. is like you have like stamina and then you have you know like th- three quarters of your hit points are stamina and then like the last quarter is hit points basically and they they, are, they have like a few abilities in the in the book in the core book um okay that kind of go off of that there's not a ton of them but it is like you know there might be like an extra feat you can take that can that you can use to like bring some of your stamina back you know between battles or something but yeah okay. it, it, wor- yeah. it works effectively the same yeah. yeah, a couple other things that are in the um, DMG are uh, lingering injuries, which I think are sure. super like underutilized. I think they're fun. I think yes. they're very punishing, so you can like kind of decrease the amount that you inflict on your players, or de- decrease like the numerals that they have to contend with. Yeah, uh, and there are um, what it, what's it called? Um, massive hits, massive injuries, something like that. Where oh, if yeah. you take like over half your hit points of damage in one hit, then you immediately die or something. Um, I would not do that on low levels because like every hit will kill you. But sure. if, if someone's taking like 60 damage in like D and D like a boulder is falling on them or something, maybe again, that's a session zero discussion. You shouldn't spring it on yeah. someone, but if, if that is established, then that's a way to keep it gritty. Sure. Sure. And uh, the long-term injuries if you are looking for mechanics for I lost an eye or I lost a hand or something, that's where you're going to find them in 5th edition D&D. Yep. All right. And our next question comes from Dustin on Discord. And they ask, do you have any tips on making a more mobile combat? Yeah. So, Nathan, I think you had some ideas. Yeah. Um, I really enjoy using inclement weather in my games. Um, I don't do it enough, but it's a fun way to keep it's a really fun way to keep combat mobile like if there is a fire raging in a city and you're taking fire damage depending on where you're standing or Mm -hmm. if there's a um a flood and uh, you have to like continually climb onto higher parapets and stuff as you keep fighting um it's easier to do those in theater of the mind but it can be rewarding if you like have the time and patience to like build out all of the terrain and stuff like uh, that can be a fun visual so um Sandstorms, blizzards, avalanches, uh, lightning storms, all of those are ways where, like, the PCs and NPCs can keep, like, trying to find shelter against the elements as they're fighting each other. Sure. Um, oh, the other idea I had was, like, if there is a MacGuffin or some, like, alternative objective other than just fighting each other that yeah. uh, requires various positioning other than just, I hit you, you hit me, um, like, um, in... End game. Can I do spoilers for Avengers End Game? It's been out for a <laughs> few for years. It. Go for um, it. <laughs> they're like they have the Infinity Gauntlet away from Thanos, and they're trying to keep it away from him. And it goes through, I think, every single Avenger at some point, just as they're playing Something Keep like Away that, yeah. with him and his forces. Like, um, <laughs> while it was generally a fairly like kind of flat, rubble filled like arena, there was a lot of mobility just because of the Keep Away element. Yeah, um, yeah. Anytime you can make an encounter about something other than just killing the opponent, uh, it's it's going to lend itself more easily to things like this. Um, I always love when I'm playing a a video game and... Oh, well, actually, so let's say a game... Let's say I'm playing like a Final Fantasy game or something like that, and I'm fighting a boss. Most of the time, very, very rarely when I'm playing a JRPG, do I have trouble just killing the boss? I feel like... Almost every time I could kill the boss really quickly if I really wanted to. However, the way that these boss fights end up being really hard is when the I know the boss has an item I want to steal. 
<laughs> and I can't kill them before I steal that item or I loot or I miss out on the item. And so it becomes less about how do I fight this boss and more, okay, what, what, what abilities does the boss have? What status ailments can they inflict on me? How can I mitigate or avoid those? And how can I keep alive the person who's going to steal from this boss? And I know that D&D doesn't have necessarily all of that, but if you can get that attitude of, I can't kill the enemy for whatever reason. It's actually something I forgot to bring up during the keeping the game gritty and realistic question. I was talking about uh, repercussions or or, uh, consequences. If you can just kill everybody, the game is not going to feel gritty. If you get into a fight with someone and you know that the solution is not to kill them, you have to explore other options and that's going to make the game feel less like you're a demigod and more like you're a real world hero. Because how many times are you reading or you're like watching a movie or something and the solution is just kill the other guy? I mean, it happens sometimes, but in in Avengers Endgame, like you're talking about, it's not, we just got to kill Thanos. Yes, obviously the option is, <laughs> or the, the answer is we got to kill Thanos, but they can't. Even right. if they want to, they can't. So if you're playing D&D and you have an encounter where you you have to do something else, I mean, okay, you can just, the DM could could tell the players, oh, this guy's just too powerful and you can't kill him. But then that that leads to its own problems and that makes that makes for a very difficult encounter. But if there is some reason the players are not allowed or not able to kill the bad guy, if they're immortal is one way, I guess. But if there will be very big repercussions for killing them, very bad consequences for killing them, that's a way to make the stakes more important. That's a way to make it more gritty and so on. But that is also a way that you can make the, the combat more dynamic. If it's not just, well, I'm just going to stand in front of this guy and hit him until he dies. If it's, I need to get over there or he needs to get over there and I need to stop him. Then that's going to lead to a more, you know, dynamic combat. So yeah, if you are trying to get away, then giving the players reasons to to use their action to disengage or to dash and that sort of thing or to hide, all that kind of stuff, that's going to make it a more mobile combat, and that can be, you know, that's that's probably going to be really fun. the th- The problem, though. With fifth edition D and with most editions of D and D, honestly, is attacks of opportunity. It you might want to move away on your on your turn. You might want to attack a couple times and then just move away behind an obstacle. But attacks of opportunity are always going to discourage you from doing that. And the only option to not incur attacks of opportunity is to spend your action to disengage, so you can't uh, you can't attack or cast a spell. If you're a rogue, you've got that option. You've got the uh, the cunning action, so you can attack and then disengage as a bonus action. But most players don't have that option. I feel like we've talked about this in the past about whether it's whether it would help or hurt the game to take away attacks of opportunity entirely. And here's something I learned recently: Pathfinder Second Edition doesn't have attacks of opportunity. Or well, at least really? attack of opportunity is an ability certain characters have. Huh. Yeah. So not yeah, not everything has them. Like it's like a fighter yeah. will get them, and then I think maybe a paladin can get them or something. But and like, like some monsters might have it or something. But that actually makes so much more sense than it, everyone. It does, doesn't it? It does. Yes. So like yeah, you you you're you're not gonna assume something has it. So you're gonna like you know. You, you might learn that something ha- has it the hard way, but then, you know, sure. you know when you're fighting that particular type of monster, you might stand still, but that's not going to be the case for everything you fight. Yeah. So, like, I've, I've you know, I've considered the idea of just taking out a tax opportunity in the past, but I've always wondered, would that help the game or would that hurt it? The fact that Pathfinder 2nd Edition has done away with it, for you know, for the most part, has done away with it except in certain situations, that makes me realize, you know, maybe the game would not be hurt by taking it out or at least taking it out, you know, from 75% of characters or whatever. Yeah. Cause even in Pathfinder, like there are, you, there are character builds that go off of attacks of opportunity, you know, like sure. you, you can, you can build into it if you really want to be that guy. Yeah. Uh, but, but I mean, yeah, it's not, it's not, 
it doesn't it doesn't hinder uh i don't feel like yeah it hinders the game like it like it does with everybody having it yeah i'm i'm thinking through different classes in D and uh, there are builds that really do depend on attacks of opportunity like the rogue being able to get multiple sneak attacks in a turn sure good point um so i wonder like if a house rule could be you like everyone still gets attacks of opportunity but everyone can disengage as a bonus action and if you could already disengage as a bonus action you can do it for a free action Ooh. Mm-hmm. okay okay so goblins goblins can do it for free rogues that level two or higher can do it for free yeah they'd still need their bonus action for what whatever else it is uh dashing Dash or hiding hide or whatever yeah, yeah. okay yeah. okay you know it, you know now that i'm thinking about it um but I haven't, I haven't i haven't touched it lately but baldur's gate three okay they they um you know they they've built it off of fifth edition D D, but like they did change a lot of things like um i want to say disengaging or or like like there's there's a few actions that were full actions but there are bonus act, bonus actions instead because okay. it like it does because the game is much more tactical and and you know you want like there's a lot of mobility in that game like there's like stuff you can climb on uh, climb up on and stuff so like everybody has like ridiculous jump abilities or something <laughs> sure and like i think jump is a bonus action in that game cuz they want sh- they want you to be able to jump around the the uh the terrain so yeah sure. so i yeah i think changing it to a bonus like changing certain things like that to a bonus action that's i think that is the way to go yeah that's definitely a good start that's definitely a place to to start out and try try and see how it goes it still punishes you occasionally like if you have to take a second wind as well as a fighter sure. like you can't do both yeah so. yeah yeah interesting okay okay yeah i i think there's there's that was definitely a great idea nathan uh from you so uh thank you got some got some good stuff from that one it, a short one but i think that was a good one yeah all right i think that'll do it for our regular questions for today but we do still have our social media questions our last social media question was or at least social media discussion topic was because it's not a question describe your gaming space uh jeff do you recall how you described your <laughs> gaming space well i'd say it's talked about the little corner i've made for myself in my basement sure. that i've you know Give did, did a little bit of soundproofing and like I got some lights up and stuff and I got my computer and a you know and my uh, uh you know all my other nerd stuff behind me on the desk. It's just it's a, it's a, just a nice little corner where I where I play games. So sure. Uh, Nathan, do you have a description for your <laughs> gaming space? <laughs> uh, not really right now, thanks to Miss COVID. Sure. Um. But I I do have a fun little like painting station in my basement. So, oh, cool. Uh, yeah, I have a few Citadel paints and a lot of like cheap acrylic paints, mm-hmm. cool. and a lot of minis that are lined up waiting to be painted. So awesome. I can post that to the Discord. <laughs> sure, yeah. sure. Uh, yeah, I've got um, I've got half of an orc army that is still not painted from like two years nice. ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been meaning to set aside time to to paint some miniatures for quite a while, but uh, I guess it's not just me then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i recently got into uh like 3d terrain design as well Ooh, so that's been fun cool. awesome yeah um yeah so we got we didn't get a ton of responses for this one but you know that's understandable it was kind of a kind of a weird one um over on facebook dan w says before the dark times it was in my friend's kitchen six friends laughing catching up the smell of cooking pizza from the oven the clinking of glass and bottles Ulf the Barbarian sets up the tablet for the night's music, and I set up the map in the center of the table for another night of amazing memories that we will share and bring us closer together. Doesn't get much better. Nope. And then uh, then the, the little indication that means this is an action sighs and looks wistfully into the distance. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. <laughs> I think we're all feeling that yeah, right now. Yeah, definitely. I just, um, I'm, I made an appointment. I'm going to get my COVID shot this week. So hopefully... Okay. Yeah. Sometime in the foreseeable future, right? Yeah. In person gaming, first or second, or is it a uh, one and done? Fir- first one for me, I think. I'm pretty sure it's the, the okay. two part one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Same as I get. I got an appointment set up for Friday, so for yeah. my first. Um, Ryan P on Facebook says, "Roll twenty and Discord at the moment." Sigh. Yeah, yep. I feel you. And then similarly, Justin H simply put a photo of a computer monitor. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Over on Reddit, Pruno says, 
Basement over Discord and roll 20. Tall glass of whiskey. Pants are optional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Alstar the Minotaur says our gaming space is simply our dining room table and a card table next to it to accommodate all six of my players. I DM off an end table on my comfy, well-worn chair. My DM space has changed over the years. I used to primarily use my computer to keep track of monster stat blocks and keep my NPCs in order. Now I have my dice, a single notebook with some remarkably sparse prep, and my Tower of Doom where I or my players will roll in front of everyone for important game-altering rolls. And I'll actually agree with the exception of, I mean, I've been doing Roll20 and such and such pretty exclusively like a lot of people have uh, during since since COVID started. But before that, I actually found myself not using my computer whenever possible. I do like to have physical notes Uh, that just it, it feels feels better to me. It feels like I'm less tempted to, I don't know, look over at Reddit or. Whatever I the having like the physical stuff in front of me that I I wrote out with my hand, uh, just makes me more engaged. I think. Yeah, it, it gives you an extra sense to to remember yeah. everything. It's like, oh yeah, I I wrote on this piece of paper about this thing, and like yeah, you could you could feel it in your hand, and it it ties it to the memory of it better. Sure. Yeah, you know, like what part of a page it's on, and that way you can like flip and see it easily rather than scrolling through. And- yeah. Uh, didn't get anybody on Twitter and we got a couple on discord. The beverage tea on discord says, how does one describe the inside of a heart? Oh, I guess their gaming space is inside <laughs> their heart. Their gaming space is the friends they made along the way. There you go. <laughs> yep. Uh, Deborah Sor says, wherever you can have a group of people, this at times has been a table at times online and once even out the back of a minivan. Huh? Yeah. Stiltskincoupo84 says, My gaming space is a desk and a bookshelf forming an L along one corner of my den. It's been all online since COVID. Oh, and there's a long chest in the den you can put a risk map on top of, and a long, wobbly coffee table. But now they have boxes of stuff sitting atop them. I will have to unbury those as more players get vaccines. I also have an old couch and a 3D printer sitting atop a dated VHS cabinet. The third corner is a small tube TV on a media cabinet containing the systems I rarely play anymore. PS2, 360, and an original Xbox modded with over a thousand games. And yeah, I guess I didn't even think to include like my, I mean, I guess my computer is where I do most of my video gaming, but Mm. Uh, Dustin says, I have a laptop hooked up to a flat screen, so I have two screens. I use Discord for scheduling, Roll20 for maps, Zoom for AV, and uh, a link to the 5e tools website for my stat blocks the beverage tea actually rather than the the heart one they uh, did add an actual description my gaming space is junk it is the back corner of fred sanford's living room thematically visually and in its essence the family stays away from there at all times unless i'm playing with friends on roll 20 and then they swarm the area en masse and ask 20 <laughs> questions about 40 problems that have to be solved this minute so i guess my heart is still my real answer <laughs> <laughs> It was very evocative with the Fred Sanford's uh, living room. Fred Sanford being the owner of a a junkyard on the show Sanford and Son. So very, very, very oh, right, right, right. junk filled. Floofy Shub says, my gaming space is my mind palace. It's like turning a TARDIS inside out. So it's it's smaller on the inside? <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? <laughs> Uh, one more Collins B says in the before times, my group played at studio 76, where I work as a senior content producer. As such, I could reserve the studio space when no one else was using it for whatever reason I wanted abuse of power. Yeah, but D and D is worth it. So Wednesday nights, we would set up tables in the studio, picture a typical indoor film studio, largest room with very high ceilings and a concrete floor. And I would use Roll20 to project battle maps on the massive projector screen we have there, which is used to show films and used for classes. And when studio was taken, and when the studio was taken, we would play in the podcast studio, which was smaller but soundproof so we could be as loud as we wanted. But alas, due to the now times, we haven't played there for almost a year. Mm. And they put a picture up, and it's pretty cool. So that's that's an awesome setup. Good job, Collins B. So that was all of our responses for the last social media question. Thank you, everybody who wrote in. Our next social media question, and this is kind of similar, is if you could play a tabletop RPG anywhere in the world, 
where would you play? So if there was a specific place you could play somewhere, if it were possible, where would you choose? I'll say I thought of this question because it's starting to the weather is starting to get nice. Right. And I cannot overstate how nice the idea of playing D&D outside. Right. Sounds to me. I, I don't think I've ever played D&D outside, but man, that sounds good. I was just trying to think. I was basically trying to think of like wherever you can go outside that isn't like <laughs> going to be too windy or something. Sure. Just, like, blow everybody's sure. character sheets all over the place or something like that. But yeah, like, yeah. So some way to play outside with like a really nice like view of like the ocean or a, or a lake or like a mountain or something. I don't know. It'd be sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Just that anything outside is really what I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think I would say and this is a very nerdy answer. But I would say um, the top uh, crenellation of uh, the uh, Acro Corinth, which is the Acropolis in Corinth, Greece. Oh, okay. I've been there once before, and it was gorgeous. And it's, like, very D&D picturesque. Like, it's got sweeping stone walls that look medieval. I think they're older than medieval, but they have the classic crenellations. Sure. And there's a few different towers on the hillsides and. Uh, it was designed so that you could shout and everyone within the fold of the hill could heal you, or could hear you because of the echo. Um, oh, cool. Okay. But yeah, it's it's a very like Lord of the Ringsy location. Sure. So that's where I would go. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at pictures of it right now. It's actually pretty sweet. Yeah, that, yeah, like yeah, some, some, yeah, something overlooking something like that would be would be great. Yeah, yeah, it's got a beautiful view. All right. Well, um, I think that'll do it for our questions for today. But before we close out, let's wind down. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> let's remember those who have come before us, who have given their lives that we may have a better world to live in as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. So, Nathan, I believe you have a story for the funeral pyre today. Is that correct? Yes, I do. It's from the um, uh, medieval France or medieval Europe yeah. setting that I was talking about earlier. Um, so an ancient ritual has come unraveled, resulting in a resurgence of magic and monsters across Christendom, including the reawakening of uh, elder titans such as the Kraken. Sure. Mm. Um, so Nice, the small port town in... Uh, uh, southeast France, like bordering on the Mediterranean, sure, um, has been uh, flooded and ravaged by waterlogged, bloated corpses and cultists that are whispering of their drowned god. Uh. What few civilians remain are huddled on the rooftops trying to avoid the wrath of the cultists. In this dismal picture, the party of unlikely heroes tried to fight back against the cultists, and they're successful until the drowned god awakens and arrives the kraken the cr23 kraken okay. against against a party of level three characters oh boy and uh, herman liebman the dwarf catholic paladin uh stands in defiance of this god all of the cultists are essentially worshiping the kraken and uh herman stays true to his uh catholic sensibilities and defies the kraken uh, the Kraken's uh, head priest tells Herman to kneel and worship, and uh, instead Herman faces them down while the rest of the party start evacuating all of the uh, townspeople away from the army of uh, like bloated zombie corpses that are coming up from the water. So um, the party is dealing with all of that. The barbarian gets swarmed by zombies. Um, eventually falls unconscious and it falls underwater, so begins to drown. Oh. Auto failing, like death save after death save. Yeah. I mean, like because he's taking damage as he's uh, underwater. Um, Herman stays behind, uh, standing alone against the Kraken, and seeing that he has no way to win, he plunges his great sword into the rooftop that he's standing on. He kneels down and he begins to pray. And uh, I was like. I'm not going to have him have no mechanical benefit for that. So I gave the barbarian advantage on the next death save and he critted. And so he woke up and managed to shake off the zombies and swim to safety. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> nice. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Herman was not so lucky. Yeah. Uh, praying to uh, 
the uh, uh, God the Father, the Kraken, grabs him and lifts him up in a meaty tentacle. And still her men prayed to his God rather than bowing to the Kraken. Infuriated, the Kraken squeezed. Herman died a martyr's death. There you go. Very cool. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's that's a pretty that's a great story, both because of the the crit that saved the barbarian, but also you know because Herman didn't back down. He he uh, he kept his faith and uh, and unfortunately was was killed for it. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, let's raise a glass in memory of Herman, who reminds us the dangers of releasing the kraken. Clink. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Nathan, for coming on the show. I hope you had a good time. It was it was a blast. Thank you for having me. Would you like to once again remind our listeners of where they can find you, where they can uh, see any of the, the work that you've done? Yeah, sure. Um, it's NathanHerdWords.com. Heard as in I heard what you said. Mm-hmm. And um, there's short stories, poetry, and some D&D content up there. Uh, I am pretty far behind. I haven't updated it in a while, but that is one of my projects for this summer once I get through the crunch time in my program. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Nathan. Uh, So that'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items to the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned in the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, on Reddit at r slash interpartyconflict, or on our interparty Discord, or on Twitter at inpartyconflict for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. Find us on the podcatcher of your choice. We're on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show monetarily, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We have a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is a YouTube channel where you can watch us play video games, such as the D&D arcade game where we cast Sticks to Snakes. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Such a good game. So yeah, also head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show what you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time, let my podcast go. Go!